The Association of Fantastic Art was developed at the same time we launched the Elix Cotton Symposium. And the Association of Fantastic Art is kind of the broader organization because we do, obviously, more than just IllixCon. So the AFA is the broader organization that encompasses all of our goals for the elevation and promotion of the art of the fantastic. Does that also include, then, the Illustration Exchange? Yes, although the Illustration Exchange itself actually predates the Association of Fantastic Art. It was actually begun in 2004, 2005, as kind of a nexus for collectors of original paintings, drawings, sculpture in the imaginative field. And that's now been, of course, subsumed into the AFA since all of the activities that we, Jeannie and myself, do in the fantastic art field happen kind of under the aegis of the AFA at this point. What exactly goes on at the... uh, IllixCon. People that are illustrators, people that are in the imaginative realism field getting together and talking about why they do what they do and how they do it? IllixCon is, it's kind of modeled on an academic symposium, which is why we call it a symposium rather than a convention or a gathering or anything else. It's got several components to it. The main component of IllixCon is that between 50 and 60 of the top imaginative realist painters in the world come to IllixCon and set up their work and display their work, and they're there, and they talk, and they visit, and they inspire others and inspire each other at the show. The attendees that come are actually a mix of young artists, art students, art collectors, are predominantly the people that attend the show. It's deliberately restricted in size. We only sell 300 tickets for the full amount of the show, so that you have a very, very low attendee-to-artist ratio, so that there's a lot of personal interaction, a lot of involvement, a lot of engagement between the exhibiting artists and the attendees, as well as allowing the exhibiting artists to be attendees themselves. One of the things that we do at the show is we have a lot of demonstrations and lectures and roundtables that are given by the artists and art directors and, and other experts who come in for the show, And because of the restricted size, the artists themselves, rather than being stuck sitting in front of their displays all day, every day, actually can leave and go take part in those roundtables and workshops and lectures themselves. That's one of the key elements of the show is that it allows the artists to be attendees as well as exhibitors. So it really is a good hands-on workshop for all involved, whether they're people that are just appreciators of the art or people that have been practicing it for a long time or people that are looking to go into that field. Exactly. There are a few other elements to the show as well. We have what we call a showcase because the main show is juried and we only have X number of spaces for that main show. And there are, of course, more talented artists in the field than can possibly get into the main show. We hold what we call the showcase, which right now takes place one evening during the show. And we offer spaces and tables to exhibitors for that. And those are first come, first serve. So they are open to anyone, young artists, students, digital artists. The main show is traditional media only. But the showcase is open to anyone so that people that don't feel they're ready for the main show or work digitally or just don't get into the main show in a given year have an opportunity to still exhibit and get their work in front of all of the collectors and attendees and art directors who attend the show. I'm speaking with Patrick Wilshire, one of the curators of At the Edge, Art of the Fantastic, the new exhibition on view at the Allentown Art Museum. I'm wondering if you think Imaginative realism is now getting more of its just due than it has had in the past with this pretty amazing uh, exhibition as as far as the depth of it, the the breadth and depth of the art that's being shown here. Walking through it, I kept wondering why it is that this sort of art has had to struggle with being given its due as being true art. It's just been puzzling me. If these paintings had been made on their own, just as works of art, and then a book was made or uh, something was made where they needed this image, there would be no problem with it and there would be no problem recognizing that it's a great work of art. But if it's somehow, if it's a work for hire, if uh, Kelly Freeze has to paint a painting that ends up being on a cover, well, then somehow it's not quite the same. And 
I'm thinking this exhibition is looking to rectify that misperception. That's a big part of the purpose of the exhibition. And actually, there are a couple of different reasons why imaginative realist art has been not so much appreciated to the level that it should be. One is precisely what you said. The fact is that since about 1890, most of the imaginative work that's been done has in fact been done as illustration. It has been done as work for hire. There are exceptions, and it's becoming more frequent now that there are more personal works and gallery works being done in the field, but the large bulk of it was in fact illustration. And the critical art community has not ever really had much time for illustrators. Even Norman Rockwell really kind of has begun to gain critical, re- critical acceptance backwards. Normally, you have an artist, they become critically accepted, and then their works begin to sell for more money at auction, and there's more interest and more involvement. And in the case of Rockwell, it went the other way around. The critics didn't really start paying a lot of attention to Rockwell until his paintings began selling for millions of dollars. And then suddenly, oh, well, hey, maybe we're missing something here. That's part of the problem. The fact that it's an imaginative subject matter doesn't help it any either, because there is kind of a common perception that that sort of thing is fanciful, that it is in some way not serious, which looking back at the 19th century and looking back even long before that is a ridiculous perception, but it exists. And then the third reason is these artists, be as imaginative realists, are part of the school of classical realism. They are part of the same tradition as the Pre-Raphaelites and the Romantics and the the French and and English academics, people like Burne Jones and Waterhouse and Alma Tedema and Jerome. For a large chunk of the 20th century, the critical art establishment has not really paid any attention to those artists either. Since the rise of modernism, the classical realist painting of the 19th century has been not particularly well respected or shown or exhibited. In the 1960s, you literally had works by, you know, Alma Tetema selling in absolute dollars for less than they sold for in 1880. The largest collection of Alma Tetema's work until the 70s was held by Alan Funt of Candid Camera hmm. fame, who bought them because they were kitsch. Now, that is now changing. You know, some of those Alma Tetema works that sold for a thousand pounds or five thousand pounds in you know 1965 are now selling for ten and fifteen and twenty and thirty million dollars but it's relatively recent that that's happened and a lot of that even now is being driven by a limited number of major collectors of the work so the combination of those three things really kind of all conspires against this particular field in terms of its critical respect One of the goals of the At The Edge show is to get the work out there because, again, it's not exhibited. People don't get a chance to see it. They see book covers. They see magazine covers. They see the inside of the limited edition making of DVD booklet, but they don't get the chance to see the actual paintings. And the reproductions do not in any way do justice to the paintings. It would be like trying to evaluate the Mona Lisa based solely on a postcard that somebody brought back from the Louvre with no one ever getting to see the actual painting, just looking at the postcard and saying, yeah, it's okay. I know that was a great thing about going around and looking at the exhibition on Saturday night was that uh, a lot of those pieces were, were pretty famous. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm looking and going, holy mackerel, I remember that. Eerie cover number number three, I, I used to own. But to actually see the real painting, to see how much work went into making the painting, whether it was that one or... Uh, the Frazettas or uh, the, the Kelly Fries. There, uh, th- there were a number of other pieces that were, here you're seeing the real piece of work and seeing the, the real work of art. And it really changes your feeling about that cover that you've known for so long or the other references to it is to see the actual hard work that went into it. And it's curious, you were talking about with the abstract painters. Well, with the abstract painters, the cachet has always been, but yes, but I can also paint a bud vase and a flower. And that you know, to, to have those proper trainings and, and classical they also have to have that in order to have cachet with their abstract work. And I'm just not sure why the reverse isn't true, why these people that are also doing this can't enjoy that same benefit. Well, 
one, there is the perception that work for hire is somehow conceptually impure, that you have a thing and you're hired and there's an art director and they tell you what to paint and they tell you what they want. And the artist goes and very, in a very workmanlike manner, much like shoeing a horse, spits out this painting to directions, cashes their check and moves on. And that it lacks any sort of artistic purity, which is completely wrong. We have a, a T-shirt design for IllixCon, actually, that has IllixCon on the front, and on the back it says Lorenzo de' Medici was an art director. The Sistine Chapel, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is an illustration. You know, it was commissioned, it was argued over, it was rushed, it was critiqued, it was revised, but because this happened back in the day, it's fine, it's perfectly acceptable, it's perfectly okay. The arts for the tw a lot of the 20th century, the art has become more and more about the concept than the aesthetic or the execution. So that's where you will see the pile of smashed televisions sitting because, well, it has this great concept that it means this and this and this and this and this, but it has no aesthetic. So the artists who have been focused on aesthetics, who've been focused on technique, who've been focused on storytelling, have kind of gotten short shrift, and the increase in the whole gallery structure of art and the increase in kind of the cult of personality of art and artists that we've had for the first time this century contributes to that as well. Because if you are a gallery owner, if you are a critic, if you are involved in this area of the field, there's a tremendous advantage to you in promoting and selling work that needs to be explained, that needs to have crib sheets, that's only accessible to the very limited few who understand why this canvas painted black is actually extremely important and extremely meaningful. Whereas work like the imaginative realist paint is immediately accessible to anybody. You don't need any background, you don't need any information. You can walk in, look at a Wyeth, look at a Rackham, look at a Frazetta, and absolutely get that painting immediately. You don't need a middleman. You don't need anybody to explain it. You know, you can look at it and say, I like that or I don't like that. That's great or that's not great just by looking at it. And so that's been another part of the issue. And that's, of course, affected not just the imaginative realists, but all realist painters and all illustrators for the last 60 or 70 years. Well, the beautiful thing about these works is that they do very much make an uh, inroad into the audience's imaginations. That the, the audience is already halfway there. These things didn't come out of whole cloth from out in the ether somewhere. These are the dark alleys, the, the, the trees in the forest that, that, that we all share so that people looking at these things it, in the, uh, the notes that, that came with the exhibitions and conjuring up edgy modern day fantasies, well, they're still there. And so there are these access points for modern day people that they have no problem getting these. And I don't know, maybe that's part of why the, the upper echelon of establishment is, a, well, they're feeling threatened. They're out of a job if they don't have to explain it there's a werewolf behind that tree. I understand this. I think you're absolutely right. I, I think that's very much part of what has been. And of course, you know, the arts, the, the fine art establishment has always been greatly about the new. It's about expanding and extending and going to new places and new things and new ideas. And the reality is that by the late 19th century, you've got people who are painting realist painting about as well as it is physically possible for a human being to do. I mean, you get people like, you know, Bouguereau and Alma Tedema and Jerome and, you know, the academics. And the other. You really cannot paint a human figure better than they painted a human figure from a technical or an aesthetic standpoint. So where do you go? Well, where the fine art field went was conceptual, okay? We're going to go, we're, we're going to we're going to look at different things. We're not going to look at the actual craft of painting representationally. We're going to go somewhere else because that's new. That allows art to continue to move forward. And unfortunately, you know, and in my opinion anyway, in, in moving forward, it lost a critical connection to the platonic definition of art, which is in fact that it is representational, that it does have a high level of, of aesthetic appeal. And I think that's been part of the problem. It, it's not a, a shock if you look at the records and you look at the statistics for major museum exhibits that the exhibits that draw the most people are things like the Impressionists, the major rock star figures like Picasso, and earlier work. 
19th century and, and previous work is what actually draws the largest crowds because the public likes those works. They understand those works. They, they see the aesthetic appeal in those works and the story in those works, and they immediately respond to that.